The main goal of ACHIEVE was actually stated to benchmark education standards and assessments so that they could make the 1994 school reform laws last. Now in 2008, this ACHIEVE Inc., the National Governors Association, and the Council of Chief Faith School Officers produced a document called Benchmarking for Success, Ensuring Students Receive a World-Class Education. And in that particular document, they asked Washington to implement tiered incentives which would push states to adopt common core state standards. Now in 2009, Secretary of Education Arne Duncan created RTT, Race to the Top, which is backed by ERA funds or stimulus funds, and there were four categories that you, for which you could apply, and one of them was adopting common core state standards. There were never any public hearings that were held, congressional or otherwise, before this RTT money, or before this RTT grant was formed and the ERA monies were released. What about conflicts of interest and monopolies? Might there be any present in this particular uh, initiative? Well, let's look at that. Achieve Inc., the NGO and the CCSO produced the document I mentioned before, Benchmarking for Success, Ensuring Standard Students Receive a World-Class Education. Well, Achieve, if you go to their website, says they are serving as the project management partner for PARC, which is a consortium of 25 states that was awarded a Race to the Top Assessment Competition Grant. So Oklahoma is actually a member of PARC, and what PARC does is create the tests for the seniors. ACHIEVE then also creates an organization called America's Choice, also through NCEE. And if you go to their website, they say that the, their particular role is to serve every aspect of that required by Race to the Top. Now, Pearson is also involved in um, the Common Core State Standards. And in fact, they purchased America's Choice. And if you'll note on the side there, we have a flow chart that indicates how all of these organizations are basically playing into the adoption and uh, rollout of the Common Core State Standards. If you go to Pearson's website, Pearson's website says that they provide complete and cohesive support to implement the new Common Core State Standards, which include English and math curricula, consultation services, professional development, and tests, as well as the fact that they're the largest textbook company in the world. The Bill Gates Foundation has played a very prominent role in ACHIEVE and also in America's Choice and the Common Core State Standards Initiative together, and also in PARC. And it is interesting to note that PARC, for example, says on their website that they are committed to developing a computer-based assessment system aligned to the math and English Common Core State Standards. Now, what will the Common Core State Standards Initiative cost Oklahoma? Well, we actually could take a clue from states like Missouri and Washington and California who, like Oklahoma, actually signed on to the CCSS before they really got an RTT grant, and in our case, we didn't get a race to the top grant. So what might have happened there? Well, the unfunded cost of Californians is projected to exceed $1.6 billion. And you might say, well, how does that break down? Well, they have said that it would cost $70 million to get new textbooks because they've already gotten textbooks for their old standards. So they've already spent their textbook allotment. So now they're gonna have to spend $70 million for textbooks, the new ones. 800 million for the new curriculum, 765 million for teacher training, 20 million for principal training, and then of course other assorted costs that might rise. In Washington, Washington State Superintendent has asked their legislature for over $2 million <coughs> to implement CCSS in Washington State. And Texas won't even sign on to the CCSS at all, partly because the cost to implement are estimated for them, for Texas, to be as high as $3 billion. Oklahoma would actually be responsible for the same type outlays that I've described as California had. Of interest, the state of Ohio actually won a race to the top grant, and they're having really large amounts of trouble in their state right now because many districts are spending the money that they won back because what they're finding is it's costing so much for them to implement the standards that they don't even have enough money with the grant to do it, so they're just giving all the money back and saying, we can't even do it. Okay, well, we really need to talk about efficacy here. So, are the Common Core State Standards effective? Well, a man named Andrew Porter, who's the Dean of the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School, 
um, and was an early supporter, by the way, um, of the CCSS, has said that our research shows that common score standards do not represent a meaningful improvement over existing state standards. And he also goes on to say that Common Core is not a new gold standard. It's pretty much right in the middle of the pack of the current curricula that's out there. Zeb Horman and Sandra Stotsky, who were actually also both attached to the CCSS project early on, and they were actually contributors and reviewers, produced a paper called Common Core State Standards Still Don't Make the Grade. And in it, they said that the college readiness standards don't point to a level of intellectual readiness for college in students. It's more like making them ready for a high school diploma. John Jensen, who's a licensed clinical psychologist and education expert, who I believe also testified in Texas, said that they're a labored way to solve a simple problem. And as an ex-educator myself, um, I'm a classroom educator, I'm still educating my own children, whether they listen or not. Um, <laughs> Proficiency really is what educators want for kids. We want them to be proficient in whatever subject they have. And it's really the practice of learning the basics that makes them proficient. It's not just adding more stuff. So the point isn't to cover everything. It's just to prepare, progressively expand and deepen your knowledge over the course of time. So you get one idea at a time, and you get it clear and correct, and then you practice it until it's mastered, and then you connect it to its field, and then you move on. Reaching the Goal, which was a paper that was produced by the Education Policy Improvement Center, and it's interesting to note that these particular people have clients that are achieved in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They did suggest a strong support for the validity of core, Common Core Standards, but they had real concerns over the fact of college preparation uh, and college readiness, <laughs> as did our other, um, the other paper. So they said that defining a set of standards as college and career ready that overlook other dimensions that make kids ready for college really makes these um, not accurate enough for college readiness standards. Closing the door on innovation was a manifesto, if you will, of explaining why a large group of individuals did not like the Common Core State Standards, and it elucidated in that document why they didn't like the standards. Well. Heritage Foundation, Friedman Foundation, Cato Institute, Goldwater Institute, and of course, Rope's Board of Directors, we all signed um, this particular manifesto, and it contains five reasons that the state shouldn't adopt the CCSS, and one of them is, and probably the most important, that there's really a lack of consistent evidence that indicates a national curriculum even leads to high academic achievement. <coughs> And in fact, the Brookings Institute has gone on uh, over and above that and even said the effects of curriculum student achievement are larger, more certain, and less expensive than popular reforms such as the Common Core State Standards. So let's look at the, some standards particularly. And this is what we were able to find in our research of people who had actually read the standards and then produced documents explaining what they had found in, the, in their research. So the International Council of Teachers of English, who you would think might know a little bit about English standards, had this to say, that the standards are too narrow in scope and drafted actually as individual um, actions so that they could be testable, and that really doesn't help in college classrooms or in the workplace. They also said that the particular standards document claims to be evidence-based but they went through and looked at all of the places where they had combined their information to create the, the document and found out that really they kind of thought that it was mainly surveys done by testing companies like Pearson that informed the standards. Sandra Stotsky, who's a PhD in reading and research and education, and it's important to note here, was also a former CCSS draft committee member, has said, there's really no research base that supports the 10 college and career readiness standards for reading on the K through 12 grade standards level. Also, she says that even though the standards are advertised as internationally benchmarked, they're not. And if you actually go to the Common Core State Standards Initiative website right now and you look, it no longer says internationally benchmarked. It now says informed by international benchmarks. There are actually few content literature and reading standards in grades 6 through 12, and Dr. Stotsky just had a real problem with the 6 through 12, 12 area of the standards in general, and then also went on to say that there was pedagogically useless vocabulary standards in grades 6 through 12. 
Julie Steine, who is a former member of the Providence School Board, has said this, the new Common Core standards will require students to read considerably less fiction. And that is true. And in a lot of ways, it's important to get kids to read biographies and things that are not fiction, because those are very important, so important works as well. But when you, when you remove fiction and you kind of cut down on those standards, it kind of, you well, you miss out on some really great books some classics, for example, and then also it really cuts down on the imagination time that kids have because a lot of their imagination comes from reading fiction. Cursive writing is not among the standards. And you know, you can argue that point, but a lot of research actually says that handwriting teaches letter formation and that actually helps with literacy. So why, if we're concerned about literacy, wouldn't we want to make sure that we were teaching cursive? Okay, what about the math standards? Well, Jonathan Goodman, who's a professor of math, um, mathematical sciences at NYU, had this to say, that the US standards were the least informative of those from South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, and Taiwan, and then went on to say that they were a study in bureaucratic ambiguity. James Milgram, who's a professor emeritus at Stanford University and is a member of the Common Core Validation Committee, also testified before the Texas legislature as to why they should not adopt the Common Core State Standards. And he says that the core mathematics standards are written to reflect very low expectations. And then goes on to say that an extremely unusual approach to geometry is used from grade seven on. And that's a real problem because the likely outcome will be the complete suppression of key topics in Euclidean geometry, including proofs and deductive reasoning. The United States Coalition for World Class Math has this to say. This omission of significant portions of essential algebra two and geometry, so this is building on our previous speaker, um, content renders the Common Core State Standards inadequate for students who enter undergraduate programs in STEM or even non-STEM di STEM disciplines in much of this country. And as you know, that's a really hot topic right now is getting kids prepared for STEM because we believe that we need to get them into technology uh, workforce in Oklahoma. So that's kind of a disappointing uh, thought. States should not adopt the college readiness standards unless they adequately identify the contact or contact contents to require for success in mathematics courses in their own state universities. And that was a problem that they found, that the, the actual math standards didn't really align with what the colleges were needing. And so that didn't really help the remediation rate of college students after high school getting into college. They said that the current Common Core standard track falls significantly short of that requirement. Where's the math? Is an organization, and they've said that it that these standards place emphasis on standards for mathematical practice, which support a constructivist or a progressive approach to math. And this is a major concern for a lot of people because this is the typical kind of reform or fuzzy math that you've heard of, and it really has been one of the reasons why kids have had a problem succeeding in math all over the nation. Uh, Kathleen Porter McGee from the Fordham Institute has said, students learn perseverance by struggling through and ultimately succeeding on very difficult problems, and you just can't do that unless you've ma mastered the content you need to succeed. And we all want kids to struggle, but you don't want kids to struggle in vain. You want kids to struggle and then be rewarded at the end of their struggle by saying, look what I did, I figured that out. Well, if you don't give them the basis to start out with, then you're just gonna be struggling in vain. Um, the Core Knowledge Institute has said relevant isn't supposed to be a synonym for dumbed down. It just kind of seems to work out that way. And my hunch is that students might struggle less with algebra, geometry, and calculus if they showed up in high school with a strong foundation in basic, basic math skills. I thought that summed it up pretty nicely. Um, Grant Wiggins, who's the president of Authentic Education, has said that they're a bitter disappointment, that they kind of have a pedestrian framework, which is a, a much more uptown version of <laughs> what we've heard before. Incoherent nature of the standards um, kind of make it hard for mathematical practice and that this was a very important one that really echoes the sen sentiment of those before which he says that they unwittingly reinforce the very errors in math curriculum instruction and assessment that produced our current crisis in math. The Common Core math writers and reviewers have been, been unwilling to defend their own standards and Rick Hess, who's the editor of EdWeek, 
said that he, over the past three months, he's tried to ask six individuals that were on the Common Core Mass Standards um, uh, writing them to actually pen a piece for Ed Week so that they could get the information on the standards out, and none of them will do it. What about science standards? Now, granted, science standards are not in our current Oklahoma State statute. However, it might be interesting to know what's coming down the pipe, since there are also science standards and history standards that will be out for review soon. So let's see what some people say about science standards. Zeb Warman, who is a former senior policy advisor for the U.S. Department of Education, and as I pointed out previously, was also on the CCSS board, has said, that the science framework does not expect our students to be able to know any science or to be able to solve any science problems. He says, the framework simply teaches our students science appreciation rather than science. It expects our students to become good consumers of science and technology rather than prepare them to be the discoverers of science and creators of technology. I have two degrees in biology. I remember doing a lot <laughs> of math. Not necessarily well, but I did. Robert Scott, who is the Texas Commissioner of Education, had this to say. There's a section of the proposed standards called modeling. The only discernible standard I could find was the student will be able to use graphs, for example, graphs of CO2 emissions and global temperatures over time. So the joke became, well, what do we call this class? Do we call it global warming now? Um, computing in the core advocacy group, which is a group that includes people, organizations like Google and Microsoft and the National Council of Teachers, has a problem because they say that computer science is largely excluded from the standards. Okay, what about testing and assessments? Because we know that the assessments have to be done if we've got the standards and we're a member of PARC creating the assessments. Well, according to Education Week, in an article that they wrote called Experts See Hurdles Ahead for Common Core Tests, that really the high expectations for tests as the way they're writing them could really outpace the ability of states to pay for and administer them. Then also, they're putting them on such a tight timeline that they can't even really pilot them well because they're having to get them done so quickly. National assessments were originally intended to save states money, but then the problem is that the federal grants don't contain any money for administration. Many brick and mortar schools, like a lot of the rural schools, are going to have real problems with the technology necessary to Im implement these tests. If brick and mortar institutions don't have internet, for example, or they don't have a lot of computers uh, in their classrooms, they're going to have a really hard time finding the money to pay for this. All right, the current focus on testing, because we've heard about testing a lot in the news, a lot about testing, and the current focus on testing is kind of tended to make results the goal of the system rather than a measurement <coughs> of the system. And it actually violates a little something called Goodhart's Law, which says that when the measure becomes the goal, it ceases to be an effective measure. A third of a billion dollars has now gone into just development, not rolling them out, not printing them, not training, not anything else, just rolling out of these Common Core assessments alone. So what about all of the assessments that the states have already paid for? For example, Oklahoma's last contract with Pearson was $16.7 million, and that was in a lot of ways for the EOIs and for the other tests that have already been done. So how are we going to end up having to pay more for more assessments. Diane Ravitch, who was the former Assistant Secretary of Education to George Bush, has said that testing really initially when they wanted all these tests was to kind of shine a spotlight on low performing schools, but then what ended up happening was by the time they got them all done there was little empirical evidence that they actually worked, they just felt that they would work basically. Oklahoma's had significant problems with testing companies. In fact, five have been used in the last decade. This is not just a problem for Oklahoma, this is a national problem, and it's described by one think tank, Fair Test, as a perverted game of musical chairs, where companies basically move from state to state as they're hired and then fired for poor, poor performance. Student test results formulate AYP, and now will be used to evaluate teachers and principals, and we can't even be sure that our testing companies are producing accurate results, that could be a problem. Well, let's talk maybe a little bit about conflict of interest. I mean, is there, there might be. 
Well, Pearson has the worst testing track record of any test company in the nation. But because of corporate mergers, it's just one of a handful of testing companies out there. There's not a lot to choose from. This creates a real problem because the testing advocates and companies like Pearson who produce tests sometimes then end up thinking on the same wavelength. And high paid lobbyists in Texas, for example, have to compete so hard for their contracts that there have been bills in Texas reducing the number of tests um, made available to students and they didn't pass. Um, that kind of influence can really make it hard for legislators to actually assess testing efficacy because it can actually create testing programs that perpetuate themselves. So you're just buying the test to give the test, to buy the test, to make another test, to give the test. Um, and that can create industries that perpetuate marketable tests as companies feel the need to create products that might sell because they've got to sell their tests to stay in business. So what are other organizations saying about CCSS? Well, an Association of American Educators poll has said that 69% of survey membership believes that the federal government should not mandate curriculum standards. Also, 64% supported the states making the final determination about the standards. That's the Association of American Educators. Teachers in the field recognize that students, in addition, they have to be held to high standards. We have to hold our kids to high standards. However, they need to be given the opportunity to learn from state-based curriculums that are designed with the goals of their state in mind. I do not hope it comes down to the time that we have the same goals as California, for example. All right, My Delta Kappa has a poll that they produce with Gallup every year. They're an education fraternity. And their poll for 2010 asked uh, a very interesting question, a number of them actually, and they kind of divided it out. In education, certain education fields, do you believe the federal, the state, or the local governments have responsibility? And 65% of respondents believe that the federal government should not set the standards for what students should know. Then also, um, they asked another question, and basically, of the following national education programs, which do you think is most important developing demanding education standards, creating better tests to, move, uh, to more accurately uh, measure student achievement? I hate being blind and old. <laughs> improving the quality of our teachers or improving the nation's lowest performing schools? It's not when even your glasses don't work. 44% <laughs> of respondents believe that the most important national program was improving the quality of our teachers. Only 24% said developing demanding education standards. Phi Delta Kappa also did a Gallup poll in 2011, and they asked the question that should education policies require teachers to follow a prescribed curriculum so all students can learn the same content, or should education policies give teachers flexibility to teach in ways they think best? Well, 74% of respondents thought teachers should not be required to follow a prescribed curriculum. Roe also did our own survey of our membership in June, and we found that 81% of respondents believed Oklahoma public schools that take federal money are made to follow federal regulations, and 95% of respondents believe that when local Oklahoma schools are made to follow federal regulations, education opportunities for Oklahoma students decline. So how do federal mandates and programs actually affect states? Well, there's some interesting studies that have come out lately. A 1994 Government Accountability Office report on education finance found that though federal funding for state education amounts to only about 7%, it provides 41% of state's paperwork burdens. And in fact, 13,400 workers needed, were needed just to oversee compliance with all the red tape. And then in 2006, the GAO reported that red tape increased the annual paperwork burden by 6.7 million hours at a cost of $141 million. It's interesting that, to note that since 1950, teachers, as a percentage of school staff, have actually declined from 70% to 51%. Also, administrative staff during that time has increased from 23.8% 23, 23 to 30%. So we're taking teachers out of the class, but we're adding administrators. And their view is because that we need to administer all the red tape coming from these grants. 
It's actually estimated that only 65 to 70 percent of every education dollar leaving Washington actually makes it to the classroom. So we send it to Washington and we only get 60 percent back on our dollar. That's like a fee. American Enterprise for Public Policy Research produced a paper, a nice piece of research, very elegant, that said federal compliance works against education policy goals. They took the current federal education compliance structure with the ERA funds, and they said that it was a significant barrier to fulfilling federal education policy goals. And not only that, but the fiscal and administrative requirements often lead to expensive and time-consuming compliant processes that don't have anything to do with kids in classrooms. Mercatus Center, George Mason's at George Mason University, also did another really elegant study called Do Government Grants Create Tax Ratchets in State and Local Taxes? Well, an increase in federal grants to state and local governments as a result of the ERA funds, they have said, will cause state and local taxes to increase. And in fact, they go on to estimate that $80 billion in future state and local tax and own source revenue increases will follow. Well, if we don't like Common Core state standards, then is there anything else that we could do? Well, absolutely. Carl Springer, who's the superintendent of Oklahoma City Public Schools, has said ACT is attractive due to the use of explore and plan benchmarking assessments. The state already pays for our, our 8th and 10th grade kids to take these uh, EPAS. So EPAS allows for districts to actually benchmark student progress toward meeting college readiness standards. Well, isn't that what we all want? We already have that. Kentucky actually compared NAEP scores and ACT's Explore in eighth grade reading and math, and then they used that as a benchmark for not only assessing their college and career readiness of their students, but they were also able to find through that assessment that Kentucky standards were much too low. And so they went back and were able to redefine their standards to a higher uh, proficiency rate. So in conclusion, often cited as the model country for school improvement, Finland does exactly the opposite of the NCLB, the RGT Common Core Based Reform in the US. They drill basics, and they don't even use national tests until they graduate high school. The kids don't even make them take tests. The teachers do the assessment in class. Centralized education policy hasn't really worked because it doesn't address the fundamental problem in public education today, which is proficiency. Homeschool students have higher ACT scores, GPAs, and graduation rates when compared with public school students because they operate more like Finland does, less testing, more drilling, and basics. National standards actually present the risk of states accepting a one-size-fits-all lowest common denominator education standard. And Fordham just released a very interesting study, just brand new, called Do High Flyers Maintain Their Altitude? And they are actually able to, in this particular paper, show that it, common core state standards or common standards actually do bring down the highest performing students over time as they're exposed to the program. So high performing students in kindergarten, by the time they get to middle school, they're already falling off. By the time they get to high school, they're already falling off. So they can't hire um, performing students, can't manage to um, get through without dropping off in proficiency level. <coughs> National standards actually do cede more control to Washington, and they weaken the decision-making power of parents and teachers. And those are the people that are closest to the students. I don't know how I'm going to complain about what my students are learning in school if I have to do it to Barney Duncan, for example. The CCSS are national in scope, but I think what's most frustrating is that even they are na even though they are national in scope, they have never been debated, nor adopted, nor even discussed by Congress on any level. The National Council of Teachers of English put out a, a document and in it that they said the CCSS publishers criteria really are a signal of usurpation of teacher judgment in ways that are alarming. Now that the CCSS have been in the public purview for some time and more is being learned about them every week, when we first started looking into the CCSS over a year ago, there was very little information out there from anybody about the standards. 
Well, the more, if you'll note that the paper that you have, I think I have something like four pages of references um, there. There is a lot of information and more coming daily about these particular standards if you just choose to research them and look at them. And five different states now have been doing that, and they're can now considering various stages of repealing the Common Core State Standards in their states. Minnesota, South Carolina, New Hampshire, Utah, and Massachusetts are all considering some sort of repeal today. It's our belief that Oklahoma should too. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attention. Thank you very much, Ms. White.